A Sermon of Martin Luther for Reminiscere Sunday, the second Sunday in Lent, preached in the year 1534. The text for this sermon comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Then Jesus went thence, and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This is a wonderful gospel lesson. Like others, it was chosen for this Sunday because it deals with driving out the devil, and by it they, our opponents, want to show that people were to strive to be pious, go to confession, and partake of the sacrament because the Pope required these things. But this is a miserable, papistic piety which lets a whole year go by until now, and then is satisfied without scriptural warrant and without people's hearts being in it, by wretched fasting, involuntary confession, and compulsory attendance at the sacrament. We must, therefore, first of all, realize that this gospel is not treating of a trifling, insignificant matter, but of a very important and crucial teaching concerning faith's life and death struggle before God. From it we are to learn that nothing, not even the throes of death, must deter us from calling upon God in prayer, even though he has already said, No. The devil always needles us with thoughts of how God's face is turned away from us, that he wants nothing more to do with us. This is a terrible situation, and thick, black clouds seem to cover and extinguish the lovely, bright sun, a wretchedness beyond telling. That's the struggle pictured for us in the case of this woman. Not only her person, but all other circumstances are so miserable that it's hard to imagine things being worse. First of all, she's a Gentile. A difficult situation under the circumstances, for that means that she is not of Abraham's seed and therefore an outsider with no right to ask for help. The thought must have bounced around in her mind, why should I implore? It's of no use. I'm a stranger here, and in addition, a Gentile woman, and he is a Jew, sent to the Jews. If such a staggering blow had hit our hearts, we probably would have succumbed to and given up on prayer. For it is no joke when conscience tells us, you have no right to pray, you don't belong to Christ. Let St. Paul and St. Peter pray, but our Lord God won't listen to you. You have no faith, are probably not among the elect, and not worthy to be eligible for and deserving of stepping before God to ask for anything. With such thoughts and troubling doubts, the devil assaults and jabs at us. But look at the woman now and learn from her how you ought to proceed under similar circumstances. She blinds her eyes and shuts her mind to the fact that she is a heathen, a Gentile, and he a Jew. Her heart is so full of trust in Christ that she is convinced he will not turn me away. By such faith she has wiped away the thought that she is a Gentile and he a Jew. Another person without faith would not have withstood, but would have thought, You are of the devil. It is useless for you to petition. Let his own people do the imploring, but it won't do you any good. Thus prayer would never have been uttered. But this woman lets nothing deter her refuses to dispute within herself. You do not belong in the house. You are a locked-out Gentile, not worthy that the earth carry you. There is no more severe and malice trial than when the devil shatters the heart, saying, Why do you keep praying? You belong to me. 
Go to it. Curse God. It doesn't matter. You won't be saved. Such devil-inspired thoughts can derail the unpracticed heart so that it no longer prays and succumbs to doubt. This incident, therefore, was recorded for our sakes to keep us from stumbling when the evil foe confronts us with the charge. You are no Christian. Your prayers won't accomplish a thing. No, not on your life. Pay no attention, but say, I'm in charge here. There's no question about that. And even though I am a wicked sinner, I nonetheless know that my Lord Jesus is not a sinner and wicked, but forever righteous and gracious. Yes, the more sinful and wicked I perceive myself to be, the more passionately and earnestly will I call upon him and let nothing deter me. I haven't the time now to debate whether I am among the elect, but I do know that I need help, and therefore I come humbly seeking for it. Then you are following the woman's example to the letter, when with firm faith you counter the thoughts that would keep you from prayer and affirm, The Canaanite woman was a Gentile and not among the chosen people, and yet she prayed and let nothing keep her from praying, nor will I, for I desperately require help for my various needs. Where else can I look for help but with God in heaven for the sake of his dear Son and my Redeemer Christ Jesus? That's the kind of heroic, soldier-like faith the woman had. Truly remarkable. Now the text states how she cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. In those words she explained her anguish, and Christ certainly heard her cry. But he answered her not a word. Thus Christ added another blow on top of her dilemma. She is a Gentile, an outsider, without any share in the inheritance of the chosen people. She runs after Christ and begs him, but he remains impassively silent as though he had nothing to do with her. Before a double onslaught like that, a tower, yes, a well made of iron, would crumble. Through her mind the thought raced, where is the man whom everyone was praising for his compassion, being quick to listen, eager to help? But all I see and meet with is that he hears only when he wants to and not when we need him. But the poor woman does not let herself be scared off. But what else happens to her yet? In the third place, the disciples become weary of her crying and are more compassionate to their way of thinking than Christ himself. In fact, they judge him to be too hard and insensitive. So they get into the act and beseech him in behalf of the woman. O Lord, give in and help her, otherwise she won't let up. Thus we have a priceless object lesson never to give up when we pray. Towler offers an example of when it's time to stop, but it is wrong to suggest that in our preaching, for giving up praying is all too common among us already. So this is a wholesome example why we should on no account cease but continue to pray, and like this woman we ought to affirm, I will not now argue the question whether I am good or bad, worthy or unworthy. I have no time for that. There's something more important than that. My daughter is grievously vexed by the devil, and I need help and advice now. Her need was pressing her so heavily that she was ready for the hard cuffs and rebuffs she was encountering. The third blow or shocking rebuff comes when Christ says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. And by so saying, he also knocks the disciples on the head, disdaining to hear the woman or them as they plead for her. They must have thought, this is a cruel man who won't even listen to other people who of their own accord and unsolicited plead in behalf of someone. And that is true. Christ is nowhere pictured as pitiless in the Gospels. Nonetheless, she doesn't relent, but keeps right on, even though she's had to swallow three direct hits. Since her cries in the entreaty of the disciples have not helped, She now follows along into the house, as Mark tells the story, like some ill-mannered woman crying and running after Jesus. But even in the house he is not free of her, for she prostrates herself at his feet, begging him. It's a lesson indeed recorded for our learning and comfort, teaching us that Christ is pleased at heart when we persist in prayer and do not give up. Even then the Lord does not open himself up to the woman's entreaty for help. 
for listen to what he says. It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. If he had said such words to me, I would have charged out of there, convinced that it was useless and that my efforts were all in vain. It was surely the hardest blow of all that as she lies there at his feet, he doesn't just let it rest with her being an impudent child and a Gentile, but also calls her a dog. This was worse, much worse than if he had said, You are a heathen and belong to the devil. Now get to your feet and stop throwing yourself around. You have nothing to gain here. That certainly was a most traumatic trial. If he had spoken in this manner to me, I would have been scared off. Words spoken not just by St. Peter, St. Paul, or some other esteemed person, but by Christ himself, I would have been frightened to death. What a superb and wonderful object lesson this is, therefore, to teach us what a mighty, powerful, all-availing thing faith is. Faith takes Christ captive in his word. When he's angriest and makes out of his cruel words a comforting inversion, as we see here. You say, the woman responds, that I am a dog. Let it be. I will gladly be a dog. Now give me the consideration that you give a dog. Thus she catches Christ with his own words, and he is happy to be caught. Very well, she says, if I am a dog, I ask no more than a dog's rights. I am not a child, nor am I of Abraham's seed, but you are a rich lord and set a lavish table. Give your children the bread and a place at the table. I do not wish that. Let me, merely like a dog, pick up the crumbs under the table, allowing me that which the children don't need or even miss, the crumbs, and I will be content therewith. So she catches Christ, the Lord, in his own words, and with that wins not only the right of a dog, but also that of the children. Now then, where will he go, our dear Jesus? He let himself be made captive and must comply. Be sure of this, that's what he most deeply desires. It is a true masterpiece, an especially vivid example that is recorded for our sakes, in order that we might learn not to be rebuffed by this man whom God permits to oppose us, as it were, and to call us dogs and Gentiles. As the woman said, also dogs must have masters and crumbs, and also the Gentiles must have a God. By such tenacity and unflinching faith, the Lord is taken captive and pressed to answer, O oh, woman, if you can tolerate and survive such blows to your heart, so may it be granted to you even as you believe. Yours is not the typical pattern that I find. The Jews are soon offended in me and fall back at the slightest pretext, even though I have shared with them a salutary teaching. You, however, cling firmly to the hope that I will help you and you don't let go of me. We see here why the Lord presented himself so unyielding and refused to hear her. Not because he wanted to present an unfriendly image as not wanting to help her, but rather that her faith might be so evident that the Jews who were the children and heirs of the kingdom might learn from the Gentile, who was not among the children and had no inheritance, how they were to believe in Christ and place all confidence in him. Her faith pleases him so much that he can no longer hide his compassion and kindness, and he states, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee as thou wilt. Thus he gives her not merely a dog's rights, but is constrained to give her what she petitions for, healing her daughter, and places her among the descendants of Abraham. Her faith brings her to such a state of grace that she is no longer a dog or a Gentile, but is welcomed as a beloved daughter and a blessed woman. This example serves us well in that when our Lord God puts off answering, we do not let up but firmly trust that he will finally say, Yes, and even though he does not say it loudly and publicly, still says it privately in our hearts, until the time comes when we see and experience it in fact, provided that we don't meanwhile become lazy and lax in prayers and perseverance. We learn this from another example as well. Joseph cried out in persevering prayer for more than twelve years before God willed to help him. In this case, the longer he waited, the worse the situation got. The more he prayed, the worse things became. 
Christ himself cried out urgently for help and deliverance at the time of his passion, but God held back, as we read in Psalm 22, 2. O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. It is the same for Christians today. They very urgently and repeatedly call upon God and see no improvement, but like Joseph, find that the longer and harder they prayed, the worse things have become. If God had answered Joseph sooner and rescued him, then no doubt Jacob, his father, would have been happy, but Joseph would have remained a sheep herder. But because God's answer was long delayed, he became ruler over all Egypt and the greatest among his brethren, and God, through him, accomplished much good both in the secular realm as well as in the church. This is also the manner of God's dealing with us. For a long time, he denies our petition, and the answer always is no. But if we hold fast to the yes, it will finally be yes and no longer no. For his word does not lie. John 16, 23, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Because the word is true, his promise will not fail. But our mind is greatly agitated by such delay, and we would much rather that God would answer without delay. But we must not become aggravated. We must let our Lord God say no, as he holds up our petition for a year, two years, three, or even longer, being on guard lest our hope and faith be wrenched away from our hearts. We will, in the end, find that God will do far more for us than we asked for, just in the case of this woman. Had she asked for even more, he would have granted it. Our Lord God thus wishes to teach us that it is not always good to be heard immediately. In urgent need, his answer is there. As, for example, should we fall into the water or be involved in warfare, the answer will not be long delayed. The same is true for great, difficult spiritual trials. But where the waiting and delay can be endured, we should learn that he usually holds back for our own good. It is as the prophet Habakkuk says in 2.3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That is also the situation now as he lets the Pope and the Turk rage against us. We cry out woefully, but he does not hear us, acts as though he doesn't know us, and lets us go on in our misery as though we had no God. But it won't go on like this forever. God will requite us. Let us, therefore, never doubt that we have a yes in heaven, embedded in the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ and his fathers, and that in his time it will be revealed. Now he builds four or five iron walls in front of it, and the devil shoots off his futile no, too. But we must learn to say, I will cling to the yes, that God will be merciful to his church and rescue all who cry to him for help. The yes is deep in his heart, in keeping with Christ's promise, John fourteen thirteen, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Therefore, I will not dispute whether I am among the elect or a Gentile and unworthy, but firmly persist that the yes is there. This episode, accordingly, is an especially beautiful example of true faith that is needed to be practiced that it will finally prevail and win out. Also of how we, therefore, must not despise the word of God, but cling firmly to its promise, never doubting that our prayer will be heard, even though for a time God delays. So, in the case of this woman, she cries and implores and will not let the yes be plucked from her heart that Christ the Lord is friendly and will help. May our dear Lord God help us to learn this lesson well, so that with our whole heart we firmly believe his word and promises and through Christ with the Holy Spirit's help are eternally saved. Amen.